So good morning, everyone. Thanks for showing up this early. Um, before we get started, this is the talk on um, partial debugging in VS Code. <laughs> so if you're interested in staying, <laughs> do so. Thank you. Um, just give me a short sign, uh, sign of hands. Who has been doing PowerShell debugging before? Right, many of you. <laughs> Who has been using VS Code? Probably also. Yeah, okay, right. Um, besides doing debugging in VS Code, have you uh, done debugging in other languages also? A couple, okay. So I'm going to... <laughs> show you how to do this today in VS Code, and I hope you learned something. Before we really get into it, uh, thanks as always to our sponsors. They enable us to do events like this. Very much appreciate it. So before I get into it, I'm Manfred. I've been in software development for more than 15 years. I've been with a company called Case Engineers, which is an automotive industry, mostly doing, like, in my day job, I do mostly C++ and, and like native stuff, but I've been starting using PowerShell in back in 2015, 16, when I was using Chocolatee for work, and never really stopped since then. So if you want to get in touch, contact details up there. Um, just bear with me, I've got like two or three slides in the beginning, and then it will be just demos from there on, and I will wrap, try to wrap things up in the end. So don't worry, there's just one slide like this. <laughs> so Wikipedia defines debugging as, this pro of the, as the process of finding and resolving bugs within computer programs, software systems. Um, for me, this comes a bit short because debugging is not only like there's an existing program and we want to troubleshoot it. No, debugging is much more. Debugging is also when we actually do write computer programs in the first place. For uh, at least me, I do debug my programs all the time when I'm writing code all of the time. So during programming, I already use the debugger or one of the debugger tools I have to check whether the code's doing what I want it to do or not. And for debugging, which is mostly like investigative work for me, so yeah, trying to figure out what's going wrong, there are like different tools and different approaches we can use. So who's done print line debugging before? Yeah, we shouldn't really. <laughs> um, but everyone does it. So there are also there are like different um, different styles of print line debugging. Uh, we can actually use the debugger to do like log messages whenever um, breakpoint is hit. Um, we can do just write host. If we're fancier, we use write propose, write debug, whatever. You shouldn't. And I hope you will have another tool in your belt after a session, so you won't need it that much. <laughs> um, then there's like the control flow analysis, which is most likely supported by print line debugging. Um, basically, what I do mean by control flow analysis is we've got some input into a program with uh, can observe the output, and given the input and output, we try to figure out what branches did our program take so that it yielded the output we observe, and try to figure out did it go right, did it go wrong, where could it have? So basically, looking at the syntax or at the source code, trying to figure out where, which branches the program t um, took. And then, of course, there are debugging tools, which we're going to have a look at right now. And they come in different varieties and shapes also. We have like CLI-based debuggers. Um, debuggers can be built into the program or shell, um, such as in PowerShell, obviously. And then there are debuggers can be backed by the IDE, which like ISE or VS Code. So, um, right, <laughs> we've made it so far. And we're just going to have a look at how to debug um, PowerShell code right now. For the sake, I have prepared like a really high-end zero-player adventure game, um, which we can use to keep our CPU busy mainly. Just let me spin it up. Okay. Sorry, get rid of the old launch config. And so we're just going to have a look at a couple of examples right now. Um, is this big enough for anyone to read? Right? Okay. So to in order to do debugging, we need some misbehaving code. So this is the misbehaving code. <laughs> and it's far from perfect, but actually it's you may as well find something like this out in the wild. And um, we do not always um, are in a, we aren't always in a position to like 
write perfect code and we have to debug code from other persons. So um, this is by design, okay? <laughs> um, okay, so we've got this zero player adventure game. What this game really does is it sends some characters, some players into a maze and they have to fetch some items just as fast as possible and come back. Really not that big of a deal. Um, so we've split it into three parts. The first part here, which is already misbehaving, is like 30 lines of code. Just going through it really, really quickly. So there's these available characters. Those available characters are the ones that are going to play the game. Then there's this function um, that creates kind of a pseudo regex out of the <coughs> player's input. And then we do things like, okay, the minimum players is one, the maximum players is the um, number of available characters. <coughs> and then we just um, read how many people there should be in the, in the maze, so in the game. And then we check that all of the players that are entering the maze actually are allowed to play the game. And then at the end, we just print, okay, this person now is in the maze playing the game. And we really want to try this out. So we're going to debug this code. Or let me get rid of that breakpoint and enable screen cut is not. So um, I have, let's say, not done any debugging before. I've just got this script I want to try out or troubleshoot. So what I'd normally do is just open up the script and hit like F5. So F5 is already one of the um, keyboard shortcuts we're going to have a look at later on, but it will be exactly the same as if you would head over here to this um, area and click on the debugging symbol and there would be like, just launch a current file, which is what you get out of the box when you install the PowerShell um, extension for VS Code. So head, um, if you've got like a plain install of VS Code, head over here, um, search for PowerShell <coughs> and this is the default PowerShell extension, which is really great, and it allows you not only to do proper PowerShell development, it also gives you the uh, debugging capabilities. So what happened now is the program started with the debugger attached, and it currently wants to me to input like, who's going to play the game, uh, to enter the maze, and I'm sending in three people for now, and I really want to join them, so I'm putting in my own name, and I get an exception. I must not play this game, so I shall not pass. Damn it. Okay, let's do this again. Have a look at what players are able to enter the game, which would be... I'm also going to send it free again. Starting with Dipper, Mabel, and I really want to play this game, so I'm also going in. And it works this time, which is obviously should not be allowed, right? So there's a problem in there, and we're going to figure out what this is. And what I would normally do now is I just create a breakpoint somewhere in the script and step through the script line by line. So I really want to know what's going on in the script. And Visual Studio Code is great at debugging things like this or helping me with this. So I'm again, um, now I'm actually adding a breakpoint. So a breakpoint, <clears throat> which in the, like, the most basic way is a line breakpoint. So you really tell the debugger when you hit that line in the code, just stop right there. Let me inspect what's going on in the code. So <clears throat> I'm going to put a breakpoint, yeah, just here for now. You can do this by hovering your mouse over to the left side and just clicking there where it says breakpoint, or you can do so by pressing F9. So you can toggle the breakpoint on and off. And if I now restart the debugger, this time I'm going for run and debug, it will break here, and it will show some indication of where the, uh, where the program currently stopped. And now I can hover my mouse over some variables to see their value. I can use the interactive error action terminal to have some variables printed. And now I've got this tools palette right here, and it gives me options on continue the program, step over, which is step over the current line, so basically go to the next line, which would be hitting F10. Then there's step into, which is a much more interesting function because it actually, when you're calling a function, it will not step over the line, it's going to step into the function. So you can actually um, you go like all through your program. 
then the next one would be step out. So if you step into a function or if your breakpoint is like somewhere in the function you've called, you can just go back out to the, to the line that actually called the function. Then there's restart and stop. Um, most of the times I'm just going with F10 and F11 now. I put a, a toggle screen cutest mode so you could be able to follow. And just if there's something not clear, just give me a hands up and shout out. So now minimum players is one, okay. Maximum players, just stepping over this now. Maximum players is nine. Um, there are some neat tools there in Visual Studio, which is this debugging view on the side. So I can see the breakpoint I set there, which is in the breakpoint section. Then there's the variable section, where, um, which I can use to actually inspect all of the variables that are currently in this script, which are locally available, which are globally available, etc. So I can see all the scopes there. And they added a really, really cool feature, which is I can search and filter here. So I can look for players. And I can say, yeah, well, filter it down. So I can get all the automatic variables and the filtered ones. So really cool feature there, because it sometimes is kind of messy to navigate this variable stream. But then there is the watch window, which is like the coolest feature you can imagine, because you can add some expressions here. And there's not only like variables, you can watch, of course, you can go for max players, but you can also do things like, well, max player is fine, but I really want to check what this expression evaluates to. So you can put in like just normal PowerShell code here. And yeah, well, if get date. So if we're able to get a date, yay. And it evaluates to yay. So you can really put PowerShell expressions here, which can come in quite handy. So um, now we're at the input prompt. How many players do dare to enter the maze? I'm also going to step over and just put in 42 here. Right. Now on the next line, it actually, <laughs> um, this is not very performant, but it creates us an array of <coughs> players and it checks if this array of, play of, of numbers, actually the sequence of numbers, contains the player count, which is 42. And I hope that it, yeah, just, jumps right back into the loop and asks me again. So again, stepping over, now inputting a valid number. Now I should get over it, right? So what happens next? <coughs> I create an empty array of players. And now this, there is this for each object which takes a script block. And when I want to actually get in there, I'm going to press F11. And now I'm inside like the first iteration of the for each object block. So what step into? So step into the next function that's being called. Um, if you're not sure whether F10 will work on the current line, so if you've got something like this for each object and you really want to make sure that you're going like inside the loop, just hit F11. The worst thing that happens is that you actually um, need to hit F11 a second time or so. so. Um, we may want to look at PS item, which should be the same. Um, yeah, now we're uh, telling our program or user welcome player one. What is your name? We're putting in Dipper, and now there is something that I really want to know. What is this doing? So we're getting a match. A match is kind of odd variable for a variable. I'm just stepping over here, matcher gets a value, and I'm going to add this matcher to my watch window because I really want to know when this changes. So now I check whether the name that has been inputted, which I'm also going to add to the watch window, which has been deeper, matches the matcher regular expression. So matcher match, uh, name match dipper, we'll just try this, name match matcher, and it says true, so dipper is definitely allowed to go in there, right? So what I'm doing now is I'm adding a breakpoint here and just telling my program, okay, dipper is fine, continue to the next one. Player two, what is your name? Which would be mine. 
Now you can see all of these variables are updated right here in the watch window, also in the variables window. And, <coughs> well, name match matcher false. So Manfred does not match anything in this matcher string. Well, <coughs> then I continue. Not matches. This is interesting. Well, it passed over it. So there is something going on in this very line. And if I take a look at the matches, well, there's a hash table, and it's still deeper. So there's the problem. Who knew this bug? Or not the bug, who knew this feature by design? A couple of you, not all of you. <laughs> right. So this is an oddity in how PowerShell deals with the, mat uh, the matches automatic variable. So when the matches automatic variable only gets updated if there is a match. Sure. So basically you should always evaluate the boolean return value of the match or not match command. So we're going to fix this. There are actually, and now I just stopped the debugger, there are a couple of ways or ways to fix this. The proper and nice way would be like checking the um, boolean return value, which I'm not going to do because I really do like my code. And I thought, okay, well, um, the matches is going, the matches automatic variable is going to be created in the current scope. So I'm just creating a function for my um, great, um, great check function there, which is test is allowed. And now this test is allowed function will get a name and it will check whether this player is allowed to enter the maze and play the game or not, right? So I just refactored the code a little and extracted all of this um, matching code here. And because we're in PowerShell, the rest of the code really st um, just stayed the same. And because we're in PowerShell here and then we really do like our one-liners, I just um, did a read host and piped the result of read host to test is allowed <coughs> and assigned the result to, so I'm in this test is allowed. It's going to throw an exception if the person, the player is not allowed to enter the maze. Otherwise, I'm just putting the name of the player to our output variable. This way we can use it here. Right, so I am just going to <coughs> um, debug this piece of code now. I'm going with Dipper, Manfred, and Wendy. And it worked, damn it. So there's obviously another bug in here. And if I just were using PowerShell best practices, and I'm going to actually set my breakpoint to this new function, test is allowed. So I'm always using the bug when writing code, actually. Continuing, player one, what is your name? Mm, going with Dipper this time. And when I take a look here over my watch window, or if I just hover over the mouse, I see name is null. Well, obviously, I did not create an advanced function. This parameter is not taken from the pipeline, so I will have to refactor my code yet another time. And so the right version would be something like this. So I am actually taking the name off from the pipeline and then it should be fine. Well, there has been one thing actually. There has been another thing. Even though there were no actually names passed to the function, everything went right. So the program, no, everything went wrong basically, but the program would have allowed, like Manfred, now it checks what's going on here. And it matched. Why did it match? Name match matcher is false. Well, there's still a bit deeper in the matches array, even though I never inputted it. So whenever you're debugging PowerShell code, whenever, no matter what IS, um, IDE or the CLI you're using, <laughs> be aware that there is a session state. And <clears throat> I have been using this integrated session down here at the very bottom of, the, uh, of VS Code. And since we just started the session, since we have been debugging the first script, the PowerShell session basically never was reset. So when I debug like three scripts in um, just right after uh, each other, 
be aware that the PowerShell session state never is reset manually. So I think they they added like an experimental feature where you get a new PowerShell session um, whenever you start the debugger, but it's not on by default. So what you would want to do is basically open the comment palette and restart the PowerShell session before you actually, I mean, it can come in handy when you're doing like model development and you want some um, things to stay in place when hopping from one script to another and debugging them. But this can also be like a, a pitfall when debugging because my example number three should have had worked or my example number two, or at least it should have not allowed anyone to go in there because the variable name hasn't been assigned in the function test is allowed. But yeah, there has been this session state linear around and that's a problem. So now I can play this game, try to send in Dipper, Manfred, and oh, Manfred's not allowed. Try it again, Dipper, Bill, and Mabel. Works. Doesn't allow me. In. So we fixed our first code example. Okay. Well, what I want you to mind whenever debugging is that the VS Code integrated terminal does have its own PowerShell session, there's session state, and when you're like debugging, keep in mind that there may be variables, whatever, automatic variables um, be still like available from before. Well, and yeah, the PowerShell oddity I don't quite like, but I get to live with is that the matches variable and there are a couple of other things um, are not reset implicitly. Well, what do you ha uh, have we seen so far? So when debugging VS Code, there's this debugger view. You can, ent uh, you can enter by either clicking on the symbol here or control shift D. This code is created, always tells you the right keyboard shortcuts. <coughs> well, there's been a variable view. In the variable view, we can just check the current state of all the variables and scopes, and we can filter in it, which is great. Then there's the watch window where we can actually add expressions, not only values. But uh, be aware that also when I'm um, putting in expressions there, you can also modify the state of your Deep, uh, VS Code debugging session. So if your expressions get like too complicated doing function calls, etc., you and you've got a lot of global state in your script, um, things can get quite weird. Then there's the call stack view, which we did not yet see in action, but we will. Um, so the call stack basically tells you on which level of or on which 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 level of function you are in your current program flow, and if you've got like um, multiple run spaces open, you will actually be able to jump from run space to run space and all of the other views like the watch and the variables view will adapt to the call stack frame you're um, opening. So we'll see that in action in a bit. And of course there's the breakpoint view which basically will stick to line breakpoints for now but yeah, you can enable, disable, remove breakpoints there. Cool stuff. So um, how did I launch the debugger? For now, I just used the default configuration, which would be just run the current script, just get going in the script. There are a lot of great pre-configured um, configurations, which you can add with IntelliSense. We'll see that in a bit. And there are a couple of different ways how you can actually um, start the debugger depending on your current needs. So we do not always have a script like this, so we can just run. Sometimes we've got like a running process, maybe even on a remote machine, which we need to attach to, which would be attached to those process. And, but mm, my favorite by far is the interactive session. So you can just say, okay, I've got this integrated terminal I'm using for writing all my PowerShell modules and deba um, so I'm writing my PowerShell modules and PowerShell scripts in the VS Code editor. But then um, when I try to test things out, I'm just I'm using the integrated terminal and I can attach the debugger to the integrated terminal so I can just, while writing code, set breakpoints along, say, yeah, I'm just going to call the method I just, um, I just created and step through it. And yeah, the VS Code uh, launch.json, of course, does have IntelliSense. Well, for navigation, we've seen this navigation palette. I already told you, so there's F5 
to either start the script or continue or start the debugger with the current selected configuration, see that in a bit. Then there's the toggle breakpoint where you can hover over with the mouse and dis enable this enable breakpoints. And you can also do that by pressing F9. So F10 would be step over, just go to next line, and F11 step into. So if there is a function call in the line, just go into the function, not step over to the next line. Well, the next example. Are there any questions so far? Nope. Right. So we will continue with this amazing game. So the game is actually called Maze Loot. <laughs> and um, now we've got a Maze Loot game module. This Maze Loot game module now loads a couple of public um, script functions, commandlets, which are then exposed, and there also are a couple of internal private functions which are not exposed when loading the module. So what I'm going to do now is just restart the session again. No. Whoops. Okay. Okay, so I'm importing the module, which now imported and printed a pretty welcome. <laughs> um, and if I do get module now, I see that the maze loot module is actually exported and uh, imported, and there are a couple of exported commands. So if I do get module maze loot, I see that I've got three comments exported where, okay, the maze loot game two is just really for the demo a fixed version, there should be two, which is get available items and start maze loot game. So I can, when I'm importing the module, I can actually not see all of the private functions, but since it's PowerShell and we can step into the model, we will just see how to step into those private functions, even though they're not exported. That's not a problem at all. So just let me see. Um, so as I mentioned before, the aim of this game is just go into this maze, fe fetch as many items as possible, and come back out. So let's just let's see what are the available items. Wow, there are a couple. So just some random items that the players can go and fetch. And I know for a fact that there's this enter maze function. And when I try to call it, eh, can't find it. You're not allowed to. It's a private. So, but what can I do? What I can do is start maze loot game. And this will actually start the game. Um, well, I. Oh. Okay. Sorry for that. I've already have tried something before. I just need to get rid of this line. Now I'm going to, well, just sorry, I had to re-import because I did change a line before for the demo and yeah, had to get rid of it. So I'm actually going to play this game now. Um, let's build and when you play the game, they both enter the maze and they will try to fetch as many items as possible and come out as soon as they're ready. Yay! And Bill won. He took 585 uh, items when he took 500 and... Hmm, there's something wrong. Well, there were a total of 1,000 items and they came back with 1,110. Hmm, so one of them has been cheating, obviously and most likely was built, but we'll figure out. Okay, so what I want to do now is actually figure, find where this bug is, and I'm going to step into the maze loot game. So I know that there is this function called start maze loot game, I just called it, and because we're kind of running short on time, I'm just going to step, uh, put a debugger break a point right at the very first line at start maze loot game. And what I want to do now is I'm going to attach to the interactive session. 
So I'm going to head over to the run and debug section here and I'm creating a launch.json config file. Now VS Code gives me this great um, list of preset configurations and then there is already the interactive session right there and all I have to do is hit enter once and I now have got this um, configuration right here. One thing that's kind of Odd to me at least is now I've just got this one configuration for PowerShell. And if I went back here or here and hit F5, it will just not run the script anymore, but use the configuration that's selected up here. So kind of odd. And whenever I um, add configurations, I just go into the launch.json and directly add at least... Um, PowerShell launch current file also. You've seen there's IntelliSense and will just work. Um, so if somebody from the VS Code team is looking, why not pre-populate like the most used free ones <laughs> when you create it? Okay, so now I've got like the selection launch current file attached to interactive session. So this is what we're going to do now. I attach to the interactive session. I already loaded the module. And I start the maze loot game. It went into it, hit the breakpoint right away. And we're now going to explore what the program does by simply stepping through it. So there's this queue of loot items, which contains a thousand items. So just let me get rid of all the old stuff in the watch window. Maybe the call stack will be interesting now. Um, Loot items, so I can see, yeah, there are a thousand items in here. Just going to check what is the total amount. The total amount is a thousand. Now I'm letting players enter the maze. I'm hitting F10. So now I'm asking, well, that's in free. We're going with Bill because we know he's a cheater. Then we go with Dipper and we'll send in Mabel also. So now all of the free players enter the maze. And this looks fine so far. So just have a look at the players array. Well, no problem there, right? Now we create a thing I call player threads. Well, threads is like if you've got a parallel string of execution, you can do so in PowerShell by creating run spaces. In um, We now got the thing called start thread job previously or up until recently we only had the ability to start jobs when in PowerShell 5 and only do the like fancy and for most things uh, faster stuff in PowerShell core. But now we also got the start thread job module which is available I think in PowerShell 5 already so great thing there if you need some edge of performance in your scripts and if you really do need to do things in parallel. So at the very core this um, game starts like your own run space for each of the players and they like do fetch the items in parallel. So what I'm going to do now is actually have a look at what's happening when we go in start looting. Start looting in just is the function that sends off the players. So bill go then that there is this hash table, which we will then split to start fresh job, uh, start fresh job. So the, each job gets a name and a script block. And in the script block, we basically sleep a short random time so that it's a bit more fair. Then each of the players creates like his own inventory of items. And while there are items in the global item queue, we just take one of the items, add it to my own inventory or to the player's inventory and sleep for 10 milliseconds. Uh, one thing you might not know, but if you tell a computer to wait for a couple of milliseconds, seconds, whatever, it basically says, yeah, whatever, I'm going to sleep 10, 12, 13 milliseconds, whatever. So this is not really exact. So it may be exact up to a millisecond, but there sure is some jitter in it. So if you want to randomize in how, um, how different run spaces um, get each turn, this may not be the best way, but it truly is randomized. 
Um, and when there are no items left, each player just puts a hash table with his or her name, the items they've caught, and the total count of items. Well, so we're going to send off the first player. Now it's the second player's turn, which would be Dipper. But I really do want to know what's going on inside there. So um, up until now, I'm just like um, watching on the on the game engine, and all of the players are sent off in different run spaces. So I really want to actually take a look at the run space of each player, and I can do so by attaching to it. Um, one thing, though, when you're attaching to a process that has multiple run spaces, you may want to start that process or that module, whatever, the program, in a different session. So maybe not use the integrated terminal because you're going to use the integrated terminal for... I mean, it works, but it's kind of tricky. So what I'm doing now is actually I want to see what happens after I send off the player. So I go back out, hit F5 to let the program continue. And there are probably no loot items left because the player has already fetched all of the items. And all of the states of these thread jobs, which I can take a look at by just doing get job. I see there's Bill's quest, there's Dipper's quest, there's Mabel's quest. They all have completed. So currently not um, looking at the run spaces of the different players, just like looking out on, on the outside. <coughs> And now I can receive all of the results. And I'm going to add player data here. So I've got a hash table from each player. And, well, player data. But this time, Bill really didn't get all of the items. <laughs> I guess you know why. We just sent off Dipper, and then we uh, used the debugger to step through the program. And um, we were like delaying all of the execution because um, the others were not yet sent off. And um, the first player already got all of the items while we're in the debugger. So if we continue this, now it should look actually fine because there were a total of 1,000 items and all of the 1,000 items have been uh, collected. Damn it. We actually did try to debug the program, figure out where there were too many items taken, but this time it worked because the debugger actually delayed the execution of the program, um, which is why it's sometimes tricky to debug like, um, yeah, um, processes that use many threads or many run spaces in PowerShell's term because you basically, by debugging through the process, you change everything. <laughs> so um, really running low on time here. So just to let you know, because this was also a point I wanted to make, um, when you're debugging like multi-run level code, just be uh, aware that when you're stepping through the program, you basically change the whole order of execution because when you're having multiple run spaces and you're uh, stepping through one run space, um, all the others will basically continue as normal. So I want to show you how to attach to a run space inside an application, I'm going to oh. This is really uncomfortable big, so you sh can surely read it. Oh, damn it, now I forgot. Um, so what I'm doing now is I'm just <coughs> adding this wait debugger commandlet, which um, just tells the debugger, okay, just stop right there, wait for debugger to be attached. Then we can use our attached to process um, from VS Code to step into that run space. Mind that this wait debugger now is present in all of the threads or all of the player's quests we're sending off. So all of them will just wait before they start. So I'm going to import, actually, force import again. And I'm 
starting a maze loot game, sending in free, which would be Dipper, Mabel, and Bill. And it just started, but it will never finish because all of them are actually waiting there for a debugger to attach. So um, we could now go back to start maze loot game. And then there's this um, while everyone's looting and nobody's finished loop. And I can actually now like attach to the first run space, which will then break somewhere in here. So I'm using the, well, haven't added this configuration yet, which is PowerShell attached to PowerShell host process. So there's this run space ID. Um, the run space ID are just numbers for each of the run spaces, threads. It's always incremented. It's kind of tricky to figure out the correct run space for your program. You can use get run space in a job to figure out all of the run spaces. But then again, you can't really name the run spaces. So there will be just run space one, run space two, run space three. If you want to figure out what run space you're dealing with, you would have to like um, do something like this. Um, get the default run space from inside a job, with, which will give you the current run space ID. Yeah. So what I'm doing right now, besides running out of time, oh no, not interactive session, attached to host process. Yeah, and now I attached to the different process, but I attached to run space one, which would be the first in each job. And now I can see the player's threads there. I can step through and they were not finished. I can use the interactive shell to do get run space. I see there are a couple of run spaces and a bunch of them are currently in breakpoints. So I'll have to figure out is it one, two, three, four, five, or whatever. I'm just going with I'm detaching right now and changing my launch configuration to attach to run space three because whatever. Now I'm actually inside one of those players' quests. It's Mabel and she hasn't fetched any items yet. And what I can do now actually is attached to another run space and debug them in parallel. Oh, sorry. Start another instance. That's weird. There's nothing there. Okay, the demo gods are not with me currently. <laughs> so, but basically, you can attach to all of the run spaces and then use this call stack view here to switch between each of the execution threads and yeah, figure out what's going on. Because I'm really running short of time now. I'm just going, <laughs> going to give away what's happening here. Um, when doing like parallel execution, we should use proper concurrency um, queues, um, collections or whatever, so that um, the threads actually um, synchronize access to them. So we would just use a concurrent queue instead of a queue um, to fix this kind of problem. And then we would use not the method DQ, but try DQ when taking out elements to see whether they actually were able to take an element or not. So I'm going to wrap up things really quickly here now that the, we may still have some time left for questions, if there are any. Um, I was having a third example, which I'm... Of, um, Unfortunately, not be going to be able to do now, but there's um, Emrys's talk, who's doing like offline chocolatey deplo uh, deployments, and he's going to like step through um, chocolatey install, which is basically running a PowerShell script 
on another host and he's going to attach to that chocolate script to basically step through it. So if you're interested in how to like debug scripts running on a remote host, Emrys is your man. Or just go and grab a coffee with me afterwards. So um, we've covered in session like the VS Code debugger views, how to attach to um, processes, how to run scripts in the current window, how to use the integrated terminal. Um, I want you to mind that there's a partial session scope when you're debugging. And yeah, we debug, um, basically debug scripts, we debug models, we attach processes. I hope um, that there's been something there for everyone. You've seen maybe something new. I know a lot of you have already been using the debugger. And yes, that's it from my side for now. If there are any questions, please throw them at me. <laughs> Yes, please. Um, so the question was that you've got a um, uh, um, hard time with the infrastructure scripts on a couple of machines which are you're not allowed to install VS Code on, right? And you want to know if you can debug those scripts you're having hard times with. So you do have got PowerShell ISE, and yes, PowerShell ISE is perfectly capable of debugging PowerShell scripts um, if you need to. <laughs> there's, uh, there's literally nothing um, that's, that's stopping you from just using the, IS the debugger in ISE. You can basically also just go for the command line debugger if you really get like a uh, problem you need to figure out. So um, you can do all of this, maybe not as comfortable, but you can do it from another PowerShell session also. So you're free to do so. Um, that's the great thing about PowerShell. If you can run the script, we can most likely also debug the script. So yeah. It should be totally possible. Just please um, go see me afterwards. It's, yeah, it will be possible. Another question? Yes, please. Yes, um, that's a great point. Thank you. The question was if it's possible to like have an advanced uh, scenario where the debugger should stop inside a program on like a condition and not only when it hits a line. And yes, that would be a conditional breakpoint. Um, it's perfectly possible um, just um, when you've got a breakpoint, you can right click on it, say edit, and you can do like a hit count and you can do like, so hit count would be when I hit this breakpoint like three times in a row, which is nice for loops or so, then stop right there. Or you can put in like an expression. So if like, um, you can put in like, if get date, day of month is free, stop right there. <laughs> or literally any expression. So you can do like, stop when this expression evaluates to true. One last question, then I think I'll have to leave the room because I'm already over time. Right. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>